This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Help wanted companies are hiring. The unemployment rate is falling, but not everything is going gangbuster. Strategic advice. Donald Trump picks a who's who of corporate America to advise him on the economy. But there's one group noticeably missing. Girl power. Female action figures are invading the toy aisle thanks to the bright idea of a mom turned entrepreneur. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Friday, December 2nd. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. 74 straight months of job creation. Employers continue to add workers at a steady clip last month, and the unemployment rate dropped to a nine-year low. According to the Labor Department, 178,000 jobs were created in November. The unemployment rate fell to 4.6 percent, but that's because more Americans left the workforce, and wages, which had been rising, fell. So, despite the labor market being described as solid, some questions still remain. But as Hampton Pearson reports, that may not deter the Federal Reserve. The November jobs report, which included the lowest unemployment rate in nine years, may be the last hurdle to fall as the Federal Reserve considers raising interest rates for the first time in a year. Leading economists say when monetary policymakers meet in two weeks, markets will be focused on what the Fed says about the path of future rate hikes. Our expectation is three hikes next year. Um, currently, they're signaling two. I wouldn't really expect them to uh, necessarily change that you know, in two weeks, but I do think that ultimately, you know, we're at full employment, I think, and we're still adding 170, 180,000 jobs a month. The drop in the unemployment rate to 4.6 percent had cross currents. More people found jobs, but more than 400,000 Americans dropped out of the labor force, triggering a decline in the labor force participation rate to 62.7 percent last month. Average hourly earnings actually declined to just under $26 an hour. Earnings for the last 12 months, however, are up 2.5 percent. Leading economists point out those trends are consistent with an economy approaching full employment. People think that there's this army of unemployed people out there who are going to steal their jobs if they ask for a wage increase. But that's really a ghost army. They don't exist. And so at some stage, perceptions in the labor market are going to improve. And I think that could spark stronger wage growth next year. While the tight presidential contest generated uncertainty for both businesses and households, now the focus is on how to grow the economy in the future. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Hampton Pearson in Washington. Lindsay Piegza joins us now for more analysis on the November jobs report, the economy, and rising bond yields, which has been a part of the economic scene for the past month or so. She's chief economist at Stiefel fixed income. Lindsay, welcome. Good to have you with us. Uh, the president-elect says he's going to bring manufacturing jobs back, but where is he going to find workers to take those jobs if we are at 4.6 percent unemployment? Well, remember, the 4.6 percent unemployment rate doesn't take into account all of the discouraged workers, all of the marginally attached workers, all of the Americans that are right now in temporary positions or part-time positions that would for, uh, prefer full-time employment. So when we take all those Americans and we add them back in, we're talking about an unemployment rate closer to 10 percent rather than 4.6. So there's still a number of Americans that would welcome the opportunity for a full-time job position in this country. You know, I also was very surprised that uh, hourly earnings actually fell. And the Fed has been looking for a little bit of wage pressure. And it, they didn't get it in this report. No, they certainly didn't. And, and certainly we see month-to-month -month volatility, but really where we, we look for that trend is in that annual pace. Now, we were up to 2.8 percent. That fell back down to 2.5 percent, which is only modestly above that 2.1 percent trend that we've seen since the end of the Great Recession. So if, in fact, we were at a point of full employment, we would easily be talking about 3, 3.5 three percent wages. But instead, we're still talking about 2-ish percent growth, which is not necessarily indicative of a labor market at that point of full employment. Yeah, so you so just don't buy you just needed. don't buy that argument at all that we're near full employment. I, I really don't. 
No, I, I think right now there's still a tremendous amount of slack, again, when you add in all of those Americans that have dropped out of the labor force. And these are Americans that are aged 20 to 55 years old. So mm. these are people with still a significant number of potential income earning years still left. And once conditions do begin to improve, we would expect them to come back into the labor force, then putting upward pressure on the unemployment rate. But so the, but the, but still there, a big uncertainty for the Fed. Aren't there a lot of jo unfilled job openings? Are these people really as discouraged as those numbers would suggest? In other words, or are they on the sidelines because some would say it's more comfortable for them to stay there? Well, I, I think there's a number of factors at play here. Some may not want to take a position uh, earning 80 or 60 cents on the dollar of maybe a job they had prior to the Great Recession. But mm -hmm. also, many of the job openings have a requirement for skills that many of the unemployed don't have. So right now, we particularly see mm -hmm. openings in accounting, engineering, craft labor, but many of the unemployed Americans simply can't fill mm -hmm. those positions with their current skill set. Before we let you go, the rise in bond yields that we've seen so recently has been pretty darn steep. What do you make of that? What is the market telling you? Well, I think right now the market is being driven by optimism, optimism that a new administration coming in is going to usher in a period of accelerated growth, heightened inflation, and much improved labor market conditions. But like we saw in the taper tantrum of 2013, when bond yields rose over 100 basis points in a very short period of time, they overshot a more sustainable trading range. And so once we start to see investors juxtapose this optimism with a more moderate reality, we do expect uh, rates to come down to a more palatable level. In fact, we're looking for the 10-year to fall back down towards 2 percent by the end of 2017 after maintaining this heightened range through more of the first part of the new year. All right, Lindsay, thanks very much. Have a great weekend. Always good to see you. Lindsay Thank Piegza you very much. You with too. Stifel, Fixed Income. On Wall Street, stocks kind of treaded water. The major indexes did not make any big moves following the monthly jobs report. Investors may have been cautious ahead of a referendum in Italy this weekend. We'll have more on that shortly. Today, the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 21 points to 19,170. The Nasdaq added four, and the S&P 500 was up fractionally. For the week, the Dow was up fractionally, while the Nasdaq lost more than 2.5%. President-elect Donald Trump put together a panel of advisors who will offer their opinions on economic matters. They are all well-known titans of business, and the group will be chaired by Blackstone CEO Steve Schwartzman. If possible, he asked me if, if I would form a group mm -hmm. of terrific people who were experienced and wise and, you know, sort of experts uh, in, in their field uh, to, to join for a meetings where he would be able to learn from them uh, with meetings on a regular mm -hmm. basis. Uh, and uh, I should pick the people uh, and he'd review them uh, and he loved them all. Other members of the panel include the CEOs of General Motors, J.P. Morgan, BlackRock, Disney, Walmart, the former Boeing CEO, IBM's chief executive, and the former CEO of General Electric. But if you do notice, there is no one on the list specifically from Silicon Valley. The first meeting will take place in February. The president-elect's deal with Carrier to keep 1,000 jobs from going to Mexico is drawing divided reaction. And some of the most negative responses have come from south of the border. Michelle Caruso Cabrera reports tonight from Monterrey, Mexico. There are 3,000 carrier employees in Mexico already. That number was supposed to rise to 5,000, but following the deal with President-elect Donald Trump, that's not going to happen. Instead, the number will rise to only 4,000. Jaime Garcia's job is to attract as much foreign investment as possible to the region. He's worried about Donald Trump. This is a learning lesson for our city. This is a learning lesson for the states. The president, Mr. The president elect Trump, have make a lot of declarations that I think nobody believes that he is seriously on his actions. Mr. President Trump is telling the truth. There are many U.S. manufacturers here in the more than 120 industrial parks that dot the landscape. A quick drive shows names like Caterpillar, Ryder, Johnson Controls, Owens Corning. And Mexico exported two million vehicles to the U.S. last year. American companies come to northern Mexico because of easier regulations and lower wages. 
The leader of the local union, with nearly 100,000 members, says industrial workers here make the equivalent of $120 a week, and that's a good salary. He says the workers are treated fairly. Also crucial, Mexico has free trade agreements with more than 40 countries. That's double the United States. That means products made in factories like this one are far more likely to be tariff-free when they're shipped to other countries. President-elect Donald Trump says he wants to rip up the free trade agreement between Mexico and the U.S., known as NAFTA. But senior leaders in Mexico say they think a businessman like Trump will eventually decide he shouldn't. And right now, I mean, I, I think for political reasons, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, uh, doing this, no? but um, he's going to understand uh, sooner or later that, that we are like Siamese uh, twins here. No? We are too much uh, uh, living together. And if we want to separate that, that's going to cost the United States a lot as well as in Mexico. As for now, though, Trump doesn't see it that way. For Nightly Business Report, Michelle Caruso Cabrera, Monterrey, Mexico. And to read more about Mexico's reaction to the carrier plant decision, head to our website, nbr.com. It's being reported that President-elect Trump received a phone call from Taiwan's president to congratulate him on his victory. It is a thorny issue because the U.S. cut off diplomatic relations in 1979. The risk angers China, our top trade partner, which considers Taiwan a renegade province. And still ahead, tech stocks have not rallied like the rest of the market, and that may be why our market monitor is buying names in that sector. A Federal Reserve official today defended the Wall Street reforms known as Dodd-Frank. Governor Daniel Tarullo criticized a Republican proposal to replace those regulations and cautioned against simplifying the rules too much. I do not think there is a sound economic case for generally weakening the regulatory requirements applicable to the largest banks. And I certainly do not think the taxpayers should bear the risk that would be entailed by any such weakening. Mr. Tarullo added that it is critical that we not forget our recent financial history. The power of populism. Brexit was the first surprise, followed perhaps by Donald Trump's electoral victory. Next country to face a critical vote? Italy. And as Julia Chatterley reports from Rome, this vote is viewed as a referendum on both political and economic change. Di Grano in Rome. Choosing which pizza to order isn't the only tough decision owner Ciro Biancolino and his fellow Italians have to make this weekend. I'm a little bit confusing. I tell you, like many Italians, it's me too I'm confusing. Italians will head to the polls on Sunday to vote yes or no in a referendum on constitutional reform. The point? To reduce the size and power of the government. We don't need too many people to be in the government. We have about 900 people, but we don't need all these people. A smaller government that could ultimately lead to a more stable one too. Italy's had 63 of them in just 70 years. So this shouldn't matter to anyone outside of Italy, except it does, because Prime Minister Renzi promised to resign if the no vote wins. So it's also become a de facto confidence vote on Renzi and a way for all the other political parties to club together to try and oust him. In addition to that, the technicalities of this vote are pretty complex, leaving a number of people questioning to what extent voters truly understand the full implications of their decision. The problem is the interpretation because the referendum have different interpretations. It's no surprise then that up to one third of people here are still undecided. But whatever the reason for the vote, the result is clear. A no vote means Prime Minister Renzi will likely step down on Monday. Then the search will begin for his replacement. Now, Renzi will likely hold the fort in the short term, and this is important. But as the country's finance minister pointed out just this morning, the uncertainty created by that no vote could pour more pressure on bank stocks in particular. This is just one of many votes in Europe in the coming months where both protest vote and populism could play a pivotal role. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Chatterley in Rome.
Pandora is reportedly warming up to the idea of selling itself. And that's where we begin tonight's market focus. Sources who spoke to CNBC said the music streaming company is ready to discuss a takeover deal with satellite radio service Sirius XM. Earlier this year, the Wall Street Journal reported that Pandora rebuffed a $15 a share offer from Sirius XM majority owner Liberty Media. But a conflicting report from Reuters says Pandora is making no new effort to sell itself. Well, the market kind of decided that Pandora's share should go up. So they shared, they soared rather 16% to 1333, while shares of Sirius XM fell 5% to $4.30. To Big Lots raised its earnings outlook for the year after posting a better-than-expected profit, but same-store sales and overall revenue missed estimates. The discount retailer's shares rose 1% to $51.39. Allegheny Technologies suspended its quarterly dividend as the company works to focus its efforts on returning to sustainable profitability. The metals maker said that its annual free cash flow will be used to reduce debt and improve liquidity. Shares fell more than 4.5% to 1693. The American International Recruitment Council said it would investigate New Oriental Education and Technology Group following a Reuters report saying that the Chinese private educator committed college application fraud. Citing current and former employees, the report said that New Oriental counselors sometimes falsified students' high school transcripts and wrote their personal statements in an effort to gain them acceptance into prestigious U.S. universities. Shares plummeted 14 percent to $42 even. Our market monitor guest likes tech stocks, and he says he has some names that should be in your portfolio at least three to five years, maybe longer. Last time he was on in October of 2015, he recommended Facebook, which is up 13 percent, Amazon, which is up 18 percent, Gilead Sciences, which is down 30 percent. He is Lou Piantidosi, portfolio manager over at Eaton Vance. Lou, welcome back. Nice to have you here. Thanks for having me, Sue. Let's get right to your picks. You still like Facebook. Tell us why. We do. We think in this environment where investors are kind of, uh, you know, there's been this big rotation in the market where investors are kind of shunning a lot of the more secular and stable growers of the market and, and employing a lot of that capital into the more cyclical growth areas, uh, in, in effect throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And it's very rare, a very rare opportunity with Facebook where you can buy this unbelievable franchise uh, for a kind of a high teens multiple and uh, in, in just has tremendous earnings growth going forward. Let's move on to number two, which is, once again, Amazon. Get me past the valuation issue here. I know there are lots of different ways you can calculate it, but some ways that you calculate it, like on gap earnings, uh, uh, put the valuation at 300 times or something. Yeah, we don't look at it that way. In, in our Eaton Vance Focus Growth Opportunities Fund, what we're seeking out are these big picture secular growth trends, or what we call mega trends. And Amazon is a leader in two of them. One, internet retail, which is the obvious play, and then Amazon Web Services, which is much smaller, but a very, very profitable and quickly growing part of that business. If you do kind of a sum of the parts analysis, if, if Amazon Web Service was a standalone business, we believe that business would be worth north of $100 billion which leaves the retail business at, at roughly one and a half times revenues. We think they still have plenty of share to take going forward and will be a dominant uh, provider of online uh, services going forward. And that's why we like the stock today. And we'll finish up with Broadcom. Yeah, Broadcom, again, playing into these big picture secular themes. Uh, semiconductor uh, company uh, that's in, that has uh, positive end markets in wireless connectivity, uh, in the data center. Uh, they've done a great job of integrating a lot of their acquisitions, Broadcom being the biggest, but there's still a lot of upside to come uh, within that integration. And the stock trades at a very, very cheap multiple here. Lou, I was just going to say, maybe you should tell all those people who are still working there they can take the rest of the day off. <laughs> There's not a soul there. Thanks for staying late for us. Sure, my pleasure. All right. Lou Piantadosi with Eaton Vance. All right, coming up, heroes that saved the world, a Kickstarter campaign, and the entrepreneur who gave girls a new way to play. It's tonight's Bright Idea. Healthcare spending rose nearly 6% last year, its fastest pace since 2007. 
According to a new government report, medical spending totaled more than $3 trillion, primarily because more people had health insurance through the Affordable Care Act. Action figures account for about $1.5 billion in the $20 billion U.S. toy industry. You couldn't buy an original female action figure, though, one that wasn't based on a movie or a comic book character, until a New York City mom got the bright idea to put some girl power into the market. Do you want to figure out the secret message <laughs> first? It's one thing to draw inspiration from the heroine Hall of Fame. It's quite another to enlighten a future heroine. It kind of stands up for girls. They're heroes, so they basically save the world. Julie Kerwin, the mother of two boys, wondered back in 2012 why superhero toys, from Superman to Harry Potter to Star Wars, all seem to be male or male-oriented. We were asking ourselves, why does Spider-Man appeal to a boy of four and a man of 40, but there's no female equivalent? This must be the end. Her solution, focus not on creating a new superhero, but instead on superpowers. I took a blank periodic table of elements, and I started writing in character traits. Hence the company name, I Am Elemental. Its debut series, Courage, consists of seven female action figures each representing a trait that defines courage. They are bravery, energy, honesty, industry, enthusiasm, persistence, and fear. Along with a friend, Dawn Nado, who since left the company, Kerwin began testing her ideas with friends. There was no toy, and we started getting the most amazing emails back from our friends, saying, I cannot believe the conversation that I just had with my child. Kerwin poured a few thousand dollars into two years of research and design tweaks leading up to a Kickstarter campaign in May of 2014. In just two days, I Am Elemental hit a $35,000 goal. A month later, Kerwin had 2,500 backers in 50 states and on six continents, raising $163,000. We had really a runaway success on our hands. The rare Kickstarter breakout got the attention of Time magazine, naming I Am Elemental one of its 25 top inventions and one of its top 10 toys of 2014. Investors called, so did film and TV reps. Target wanted I Am Elemental on its store shelves, but Kerwin has resisted temptations to go big too quickly. You cannot put my figure on a shelf in Target next to Frozen because no one is going to buy something they've never heard of. Instead, the figures are sold online and in about 50 smaller specialty toy stores around the country. Prices start at $25. I am elemental, not yet profitable, but Kerwin says it might well be in 2017. Ironically, while I sell superpowers, I don't have enough power yet to dictate how the story goes. A story told in part by Kerwin's customers. For the just released second series, Wisdom, a New York City second grader helped Kerwin explain one of the superpowers, mastery. Her teachers taught her, practice makes progress instead of practice makes perfect. perfect. You want to explain to Oliver why? Because basically nothing is perfect. The type of best practice that might bring out the superhero in any of us. All kids should know that real heroes walk among us and shared everyone's powers grow stronger. Julie Kerwin has five more superpower sets sketched out, ready to go into production. She's still getting noticed, too. Last week, the Toy Industry Association nominated I Am Elemental for two awards, Action Figure of the Year and Rookie of the Year. Winners to be announced in February at the New York Toy Fair. I think there's a matter of time before she gets into stores like Target. I think so, too. I, Don't I sell think, herself short. I, I think you're but absolutely right. And you're going to cover it in February for we'll us, right? There. Keep us posted? Good. That does it for Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for watching. We want to remind you that this is the time of year your public television station seeks your support. And we thank you for your support. I'm Tyler Matheson. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you Monday.